Hey, everybody, you are listening or watching Wake Up Call the Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Previn, and joining me today for an edition of the Hashtag Fem Doctor series is Dr. Avi Varma, MD. She practices family medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome, Dr. Varma. Thank you so much for having me today. Of course, I'm excited to have you on. And one of the things that I noticed about you is that you actually have your own podcast. Yeah, that's correct. Tell us about that. Sure, absolutely. So I am one of the co-hosts of Brown Girl White Coat podcast. Um, it originally came about about two, three years ago now um, through one of our co-hosts. And then in the last, I want to say six months, she decided to expand her team. So we are now a team of four and we each rotate weekly um, and, you know, um, we each have our own independent uh, episodes, but all have the same goal for the podcast. So it's been really great to collaborate with them. And it's been a great experience so far. I love the name. Thank you so much. It's very much representative of our group or cohort. So yeah. And is your audience other doctors or is it just pretty much anybody? Really, it's open to anyone, of course, but um, we find that oftentimes our listeners are in the medical field. Um, the other three co-hosts are all in medical school still, so I'm probably the most senior of the group, and so I bring in a different perspective being, you know, having several years under my belt there and in practice, but um, we tend to find we have more medical students or residents, but in general, everyone tends to be in the healthcare field. So I didn't do the greatest job introducing you. I kind of gave just the very basic. So maybe you could do a little better job telling us a little bit about your practice and what you do. Sure, absolutely. So I work for a nonprofit organization based in Atlanta, Georgia. We have several locations um, within our communities and we serve patients from uninsured and underinsured communities. Um, so our patients are uninsured or underinsured, excuse me. Um, majority of our patients are of minority population and they all have HIV and AIDS. So as a primary care physician, I have the honor of taking care of their primary care needs as well as addressing their needs in regards to HIV and AIDS. Um, as an organization, we provide more services beyond just healthcare. We also address any social issues regarding, for example, housing, which has been such an issue during the pandemic. So we have social workers um, and case managers that assist in this. Another component that is key is pharmacy as well as mental health services. So we try to provide more of a comprehensive approach to our care. Uh, outside of work, I am working towards getting my master's in public health through Johns Hopkins. They have a great online program. And so I should be completing that sometime this year. <laughs> Wow, you have your plate full. Yeah, and your definitely. mom. And your yes. mom. Yes. Yes, I have a yep, I have a three year old uh, daughter. So she definitely keeps me on my toes as well. It sounds like you are really busy. I have to ask you what drove you after already having an advanced degree to go back to school and get another degree. You know, I'd been debating for a while about pursuing another degree. I think having an MD under my belt has been great because I've been able to meet my goal of helping other people, but there are many ways to do that, not just through a healthcare field. And from my perspective, I wanted to go beyond just taking care of patients on an individual basis. My long-term goal is to help more on a population level. And I felt that in order to do that, I did need and require more training. And so I decided to pursue a master's in public health as a result of that. And do you think that'll just serve you with what you're doing now? Or do you foresee other opportunities coming available to you that you'd like to pursue? I think it definitely 
even now, um, as far as I've gotten into my degree, it has helped me in my current career. But I do hope that in the coming years, and this is more of my long term plan is to pursue more work on that population level. So maybe more working more in healthcare policy, um, and in some form of leadership, for sure. Well, I could definitely can see that about you. I feel like you were one of those kids in school that was the leader of every club. Were you? I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't exactly say that. Um, I tried to balance life the best that I could. But yes, I, I have always been pretty driven. I haven't always known exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I knew that I wanted to help people and I figured it would be through medicine. But like any other person, you know, I've had my ups and downs and uh, there was a time I didn't want to go into medicine. So, I mean, it's a, it's just been over time, you know, you kind of learn and find your path and that's pretty much how it's been for me. Well, that's an excellent segue into my next question. I wanted to get into, did you know that you, did you always know you wanted to be a doctor and how did you sort of figure that out? It's a great question. So I knew from a young age that I wanted to pursue medicine. I had some great um, role models in some family members. My immediate family does not consist of doctors. So my parents are not doctors and my sister chose not to pursue medicine. Um, she has a very different career, but um, I do have an uncle and an aunt who are in the medical field and they've played great role models for me. One practices in the US and one practices in India. And so we still have family in India and we would go there often when I was a child. And so I got to see him build his hospital from the ground up and he's a director of this hospital in New Delhi. So it, you know, it really inspired me to pursue medicine. But like I said, I didn't always know there were moments in time where I felt like maybe I'd be better suited in a different career. And that happened really in college when I struggled a little bit and thought maybe, you know, with all the classes being offered, I felt like maybe trying something different. So there was a time I considered business, for example, um, but I found my way back to medicine in the end. So if I can ask, did you get maybe not the best grade in a science or something? Because I know someone who wanted to be a doctor, but he got a B, maybe a C in chemistry or something. And that was enough for him to change his whole career. I have to say that with sciences, I didn't often struggle with my classes. That being said, I did get a couple of Bs. It's, you don't have to have, and I want to just say that you don't have to have all A's to pursue medicine. And I often hear this from other students who are struggling. And I hate to hear that someone changed their mind about medicine because they got a C, because I know plenty of people that struggled with classes, but still, you know, were able to pursue medicine. And one thing I will say is that I do think the culture needs to change in the medical field. We need more doctors. And it is competitive to get into medical school, but I think that we need to be a little bit more open-minded because in the end, it's not the grades that make you a good doctor. It's really how you interact with patients. Um, are you compassionate? Um, do you care for other, the well-being of other humans? I mean, those are the things that truly matter as opposed to having one C, you know, that brings down your GPA just a little bit. I think in that case, it was sort of the um, drive to have perfection, which I know a lot of lawyers suffer from that. Is that something oh, that's, that's totally something that doctors suffer from? too? <laughs> yeah. I can definitely relate to that. Um, I, I do feel a lot of doctors and I'm, I'm sure lawyers too tend to have more type A personalities where they have to be the best. And, um, you know, that's something that I think we all to a certain extent may struggle with a little bit. But, um, you know, I think I still struggle with that. But it is I think it's just part of what comes with the job. And I don't necessarily like that it's like that. Um, so personally, I, I try my best seeing, you know, what struggles that I might have gone through. I, I do try to talk to future prospective medical students because we need, we need more doctors out there and anyone who's interested, you know, I try to really advocate for them. 
Is there a shortage of doctors? I would say so. I would say in any specialty, you'll find that. I can really speak to primary care that there is always a shortage of primary care physicians. Um, You know, and in the medical field, unfortunately, burnout rates tends to be high. And I would suspect that the rates are even higher now during the pandemic. Um, But, you know, I'll constantly get messages and emails about job opportunities. It's just the nature of the field. I mean, you can even look on that individual level when you talk to, when I talk to my patients, some may say, it took me a long time to get in here to see you. I mean, that's a very basic uh, quote that I can provide to you from many patients because oftentimes it does take a long time for you to see your own doctor because they're so overbooked um, because of the shortage and the fact that, you know, primary care physicians just, they are, we're understaffed and overworked at times. Well, I know that you explained that you serve uh, the underserved, underinsured or um, not insured population. So maybe this isn't something you see quite as much, but I know that a lot of physicians complain about how so many of the considerations now in their practice is dictated by health insurance companies. I can say as a patient, it's frustrating when you go to the doctor and you wait in the waiting room for well over an hour. And I, I understand it's been explained to me how that happens, that you have to book so many appointments in one day just to make money. Yeah, I would agree with uh, what you said about insurance companies. Unfortunately, oftentimes health insurance companies do dictate how Uh, physicians are practicing. Uh, It really shouldn't be like that, um, but that's the nature of how things are run in the U.S. And so oftentimes I'll hear, and like like I said, or like you said, you know, I, I don't see it as much because oftentimes my patients are uninsured, so I don't even deal with it. But I didn't always work in this situation. I did, um, you know, my previous job, I did have to see a lot of patients that had insurance. And so, you know, we had to meet certain metrics, one of them being, you know, making sure we're seeing several patients a day. And, you know, so you less, you you have less time with each patient. And so from a patient perspective, I 100% understand why it would be frustrating to have to not only wait to see your doctor, but you get to the appointment and you're waiting to see them. And then when you see them, oftentimes, it's maybe a 15 quick 15 20 minute visit and that can be frustrating from a patient's point of view but it is also actually frustrating from the physician's perspective because we want to be able to spend more time with our patients but unfortunately we don't always have that um, availability what about where you are now do you get to have more time with your patients because everything's not dictated by health insurance or is there still a health insurance component there? So we, we still have patients that have insurance, but because we have a lot of uninsured patients in Georgia in general, unfortunately that comes with the whole Medicaid wasn't expanded. And so we have less patients on insurance and that's a frustrating thing in itself. I'm not saying being uninsured is a good thing. We want our patients to have insurance and that support. But in my case with my patients, I don't necessarily have as much of that dictated by insurance companies. So I don't necessarily have you know, we still want to meet the same metrics of screenings and all of that, but the time limit and time allocation, I tend to find that I have more time with my patients. And some of that actually more has to do more with the um, disease process in itself, because all of my patients have HIV and or AIDS. And so what happens with that is, you know, they tend to have a lot going on with them in terms of their health. And so I have to spend more time with them and sort through everything that's going on. That's, I love what you're doing. And I really want to get more into that. Um, because I, I guess I can speak for myself, but I think this sentiment might apply to other people too, is that, I'm not sure that I see as much attention given to AIDS research. Maybe it's just because we've kind of gotten acclimated to it and it's like, oh, you know, another, just another part of our world, right? That we're just used to seeing. Is that true? 
I don't think I can really speak to research itself because I'm not specifically involved in research. I do think that research is actively going on for HIV and AIDS. I mean, we're looking and I hear about reports, obviously, that we're trying to find the cure. That's going to be key. Additionally, finding a vaccine that works is going to be very important. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's not actively happening. It definitely is. It's just there's it's it's such a complex virus. And so there's a lot that to unpack when it comes to that. So I think what what I'm really trying to ask you is, at least from my perspective, public sentiment is, in my opinion, it seems different. It's like people kind of have this attitude that, well, we don't have to worry about AIDS anymore. You know, it's not like it used to be. It's not a death sentence there. You can get meds now. And I think, unfortunately, that can often lull people into a false sense of security where maybe they're not as safe as they used to be. And actually, I heard from another physician that this is actually a problem with syphilis, which I think a lot of us just don't think about. Right. But it's still out there. It's still around. And they're actually seeing increased cases of it, I think because of that very reason. So do you have any opinion about that, about, I guess, public attitudes? I would have to um, agree with it that we do have this attitude that, you know, HIV doesn't kill anymore. It's not like it was in the 1980s and early 1990s, and we don't see AIDS cases as much. It's true that things have improved because we have medications that can help to control HIV. But unfortunately, you know, I agree that people are oftentimes lulled into this sense of security that this is really not a problem. But truly, it HIV is a chronic disease. It's something that once you contract it, you live with it for the rest of your life at this point in time. I do hope that we come come across a cure. But in the meantime, you know, we have to work with what we have. And I see many cases of AIDS. I, you know, I can't really speak to what the current mortality rate is from AIDS in our country. But, um, you know, I have seen, I've had patients that have passed away from AIDS. On the other hand, I've had patients that have, you know, are living into their 90s and they're not sick from their HIV, they're sick from their heart disease or their mm-hmm. diabetes. So, you know, you have a wide spectrum when it comes to HIV. Um, one statistic I can give you is that one in seven people don't even know they have HIV. So it is still prevalent and we need to be aware of it. And unfortunately, when you were talking about syphilis, I would have to agree with the physician or healthcare provider that you spoke with that syphilis is on the rise. It is a very easily treatable infection, but because it often goes overlooked, we end up seeing increasing rates. And, you know, we're also seeing increasing rates of congenital syphilis, which is a terrible disease to have to see in a newborn. Um, and again, it's something that's completely treatable, uh, safely treatable in pregnancy. So it's another infectious disease that is on the rise. And we're not really thinking about it because oftentimes people are like, well, we have a treatment available if it happens. And the issue is that you may not even have symptoms from it or develop symptoms. So you will not know unless you actually get screened for the infection. Yeah. So that that's striking to me because when, how would you even, you're, you're saying people don't know that they have it, but how would they know? Because there's no symptoms and it's not like most of us are going off to the doctor at once a year with our blood work, having them test us for syphilis. Maybe we should start doing that. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that as a healthcare provider and in the healthcare field, we have to do a better job of educating our patients and screening them. I'll take HIV as an example that, you know, we 
recommend screening between the ages of 15 and 65. Um, that may have changed more recently with guidelines, but that's kind of the guidelines we've been following over the last several years. But it's what's called an opt-out test. And what that means is you offer it to your patient and they can decide if they don't want to take the test. And unfortunately, when I work just in primary care, oftentimes I would hear patients say, we don't need to be tested for that, we're fine. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about HIV, when you are initially, when you initially contract the virus, you may go through a spell of what feels like a flu. So you have flu-like symptoms. So you may not necessarily think that you have the flu. I can speak to some patients that I have that probably had HIV for years, and then they present to us finally when they're very sick with AIDS. And so working on improving their immune system can be quite tedious and can take a long time. So I do think as you know, in the healthcare field, we have to do a better job of educating the general public. Yes, and um, I would like to see that especially because of what we talked about previously, that there's sort of this attitude that, no, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, maybe you could explain to me really the difference between having HIV and having AIDS. Yeah, so HIV is actually, so it stands for human immunodeficiency virus. So it is the actual virus that you contract that causes this disease. AIDS, basically is when your immune system is so weak that you can you know, become susceptible to infections that someone who doesn't have HIV would not be susceptible to, which is why you often hear with AIDS patients that they develop some infections that we don't normally hear about because their immune system is so weak that someone with a healthy immune system may easily fight off. So for example, we don't see as often, we don't see cases of tuberculosis or TB infections in our country compared to more developing countries. And, but that is something that our patients with AIDS are at risk of. Once you have HIV, you always have HIV. AIDS though is something that is reversible with medication to treat. So that's, hopefully that helps to distinguish the two. Um, yeah. it's, it's definitely something I get asked on a regular basis from my patients that are newly diagnosed with HIV and or AIDS. So you can go from being HIV positive to having AIDS, but you can also go back from having AIDS to being HIV positive. You, once you have HIV, you're always HIV positive. It's just a matter of how strong or how weak your immune system is. So if you have a very weak immune system, that's when we say based on lab values that, hey, your immune system has dropped below this threshold, you now have an additional diagnosis of AIDS. And like I said, that is reversible because we are able to improve our patients' in immune systems with the use of HIV treatment. And that's something you can detect simply with a blood test? Yeah, absolutely. Is there, are there just medications now that you can give people that would strengthen their immune system? Yeah, basically the medications that we use for HIV treatment helps to boost the immune system. So it's bringing down or curbing the HIV virus in your bloodstream, essentially, but it's also helping to improve and enhance your immune system. So if they're HIV positive, are there also drugs that you give them to try to keep their immune system as strong as possible? Nothing in addition or supplementary. It truly really is just the HIV treatment that we provide to our patients that helps to what people like to say, boost the immune system. So I often get asked that from patients too, is how can I boost my immune system? And I say, you're already on the treatment to help to improve your immune system and to reverse if they have AIDS, to reverse the AIDS process. That is really fascinating. This is all stuff that I didn't know, and I consider myself to be an educated, um, informed person. Are there certain symptoms that you might see in someone typical of having AIDS, or is it is it really just opportunistic? Like they could get a cold, but they can't fight it off. Or you said, you know, they have exposure to TB, and and it can be devastating. Is it is that it? So. A lot of times symptoms that we'll see in patients that either have, you know, 
HIV that they probably had for a long time on the verge of AIDS or having AIDS, they tend to have unintentional weight loss. So that's something where, you know, they're maybe eating regularly, but still losing a lot of weight. Now we often hear that with cancer patients. So it is something that you can also see in AIDS patients. Um, sometimes patients don't have a great appetite as well in addition, but that's more, I would say, you know, you feel like it's a little bit of a vague symptom, but it still can add to what we would be concerned about in patients that have AIDS. Um, you may see patients with a lot of GI symptoms, so gastrointestinal symptoms, where maybe they're having a lot of diarrhea. Um, you can also, but the main thing that we find in these patients is that they have or may develop opportunistic infections. And oftentimes, unfortunately, if it's come to an AIDS diagnosis, it's They've had HIV for years and, you know, they were never screened, for example, and then they suddenly develop a strange form of, or I shouldn't say strange, just an atypical form of a lung infection. And so then you become curious, why is that? And sometimes it's, you know, it's, a, and this is kind of changing gears, but you could be completely healthy but you go in to see your regular doctor, you get a blood test done to make sure you know, you're not anemic and we see that your white blood cell count is low. A white blood cell count is something we monitor for an infections. And if it's low, one of the causes of that can be HIV. So you know, we always recommend a test at that point just to screen and to rule out HIV. I feel like anybody who's ever had diarrhea now is going to be afraid that they have AIDS. <laughs> It's and, like and yeah, and I like to say that like you can't look at each symptom as an individual, you know, as an individual thing. What we do is we're really looking at the whole picture, you know, and that's, you know, I like to call medicine investigational work in itself. Like I growing up, I used to think of it as like you're in a you're a detective trying to figure out what's going on with the patient. And that truly is what it is. But AIDS is like a culmination of different symptoms. And so it's not just, they have diarrhea, they must have AIDS. They yeah. have unintentional weight loss, they must have AIDS. And I think that comes to our culture of Googling symptoms and finding you know, all these potential causes. And I think that drives up everyone's anxiety levels. So. Yeah, something to be mindful of for sure. Yes, so I have absolutely been guilty of consulting with Dr. Google. And it's, I, I'm not sure why I do that because as an attorney, I hate when clients do that, when they'll find some obscure thing they found on the internet and be absolutely certain that that's what they need me to do for them. <laughs> And, you know, it's ignoring, you know, all the years of training that we've had. Right. But I think, you know, I think, and this is applicable to a lot of things, but we live in a society now where we want things immediately, right? Like instantaneously. Right. And I can get an instantaneous answer on Google. That's right. probably wrong, but it satisfies something in you to see, okay, well, it could be nothing or I could be dying or someplace in the middle. Right. Absolutely. I think that's the struggle with having such easy access to information in this digital age, right? Is that you, you know, a lot, oftentimes, I mean, it's the same in the medical field is we'll have patients say, I'm pretty sure I know I have this and I need you to treat me for this. And so, you know, it's, it becomes this whole conversation and a lot more education goes into that. And I'm fine with it. I love educating my patients. I love educating other people, but um, I think it's just something that you just have to take with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what I would, what I would tell people, and I try to be mindful of this too, cause I'm guilty of it, but you're getting information online. That's it. You're not getting expertise. You know, right. you need someone who can really look at your situation. This applies with what I do too. look at your situation and apply it. Exactly. Just, that's really what you're not getting online. Right. So I want to back up a little bit and go back to med school. So where did you go to undergrad and med school? So I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor for undergrad. And then I actually went to a Caribbean medical school, American University of Antigua. And that is a whole story. I actually 
um, when they have a, they had a twinning program that was based in India. So I actually did my first two years of training in India. And then I actually bypassed the island altogether, came back to the US and completed my clinical rotations, which in the third and fourth year of med school, you standard do clinical rotations. So I did those in the United States. So is the first two years mostly academic learning from a book, memorizing a lot of stuff, and then the last two years is clinical rotations largely? Yes. So, yep, exactly what you said. You're sitting mostly in lectures in the first two years, and then you're really just applying that knowledge, and that's what you do in clinicals. Oh, that's good. So it's, it's, I've always thought you doctors have to know so much information. I mean, the body is incredible. It's doing so many different things all at the same time. It, it's really astounding what you need to know, just, just to even understand how the body works, forget about curing a disease. So, and you're telling me that you learn most of that in two years. <laughs> I think that medicine is a field in which you're constantly learning. I always say that because it's true. If you think about it, we know science is constantly evolving. We're finding new techniques and things like that. So I think to be a good doctor, you really have to continue to read up and learn about updates and such, right? We didn't know anything about coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 and we're learning about it. And so I think that's the... I, I would say that's the beauty in medicine because I, I love to learn, I love to read. So I'm constantly learning. So going into medical school is very difficult. It's a lot of information and it is oftentimes very overwhelming. I think just over time, you just, for me at least, I just became used to the fact that I have to constantly try to keep up. And, and I, I just wanna say that not one doctor knows everything. <laughs> There's yeah. no way one doctor can know everything that has to do with medicine, right? So it's just something to be aware of. The the basics, you're learning the basics of the human body and how it functions in those two years. Okay, so that can that seems a little bit more doable. How did you select your area of specialty? And, and you know, what did you think that you were going to do? So I chose family medicine because of what it offered to me. So as I went through my clinical rotations, I realized that I liked different parts of different specialties. For example, I really enjoyed pediatrics, so taking care of kids. I really enjoyed internal medicine, where you care for adults and the geriatric population. Um, I also enjoyed doing some procedures, but smaller procedures, not like the big surgical ones where you have to go into the OR. So for me, family medicine was the best of all of the things that I liked about different specialties. So for me, it's definitely been the best fit. Additionally, I really love to interact with my patients. So I knew that whichever specialty I chose, I wanted to have that interaction. And most specialties, you do have a certain level of interaction, but I wanted that connection with my patients that you build relationships with your patients over time. And for me, family medicine really stood out. You're not the first femme doctor I've heard say that. I, I, lot, I think a lot of physicians do want that personal relationship, the rapport that you build over time, which yeah, I guess- Yeah, I think that's part of you know why you would pick medicine, right? Is to build that relationship for sure. I think to a certain extent you should, you have to want that um, to have that kind of connection and communication with your patients. And it, it, something struck me when you were talking about the doctor shortage, it's such a huge commitment to go into medicine. It, it's a, a long time for schooling just to, for medical school, um, then your residency. And then if you want to specialize in something, you have to do another one. So, and not to mention, I don't think I know any physician who has less than $200,000 in student loans. Yeah, I think it's, um, 
if, if someone is debt free, I really need to know how they did that because it's really not easy uh, um, to go through medical school. And like you said, it is a lot of years of training and commitment. And I mean, I personally know a lot of students that, you know, ended up leaving the field because it was, it was too much for them. And um, I think it is a very difficult field. Um, and I think that on top of that, having all the loans doesn't make it easy. So I think those are definitely reasons why we don't necessarily see as many uh, students go into the medical field. That being said, you know, I've heard recently that, you know, a lot more students are going into medicine after um, or well, during this pandemic, they're seeing the need. So I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, I would think, especially right now when doctors are always important, but I think you don't truly appreciate them until, much like lawyers, not quite the same. <laughs> and not too many people love lawyers, but <laughs> when you need one, you really need one. And it's the same for doctors. When you really need one, you need one. And I know I have friends who hate going to the doctor. They avoid it. Yeah. But when you really need a doctor, and there's so many of us now that do, yeah, you really need one and and yeah. it's indispensable. How has COVID affected your practice and the people that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, it's I know it's been tough for everyone all around. It's been difficult for my clinic. Um, you know, we had to figure out really quickly, especially with our population, how we're going to navigate the appointments, making sure we still provide care without hiccups. And so it was a lot of planning and meeting virtually, of course, to figure all of this out. And so the biggest, one of the biggest things was transitioning from all in-person visits to now creating a virtual or telehealth platform. And so something that should have taken years, you know, was developed in a matter, matter of months. And you know, to make sure that it's a secure system and all that had to go, there's a lot of work that went into that. But um, so we really transformed things to make sure that we stayed open. And for patients that didn't necessarily need to be seen in person, we're transitioned to, you know, telehealth visits. And so it was, it was definitely a team collaborative effort between the healthcare providers and the administration um, of our organization because we had to figure out the best way to do this. So, I mean, it, and I know I've seen this in so many, um, with so many of my physician colleagues in other healthcare systems too and how everyone's been struggling and having to navigate it. So it's been tough. Yeah, how do you feel about telehealth? Because- I imagine there has to be something missing when you're just like you and I are doing this with Zoom right now. There's just there's some element of connection that's different than when you're face to face, especially if you have to actually physically examine somebody. Yeah, so I it's definitely been a bit of a struggle when it comes to that, which is why personally for patients that are more stable, um, I've personally alternated visits where I'll see them once in the clinic and once on a telehealth in a telehealth appointment because you are missing that in person connection like you said that being said if you think about it in the clinic setting i miss that in person connection even when i'm seeing them in person because we're in masks we're in full garb where you know they can't see my face a lot of human connection and interaction is with seeing someone's expressions and emotions and you can't get that in those in person visits either so i think that there are benefits there are pros and cons in both situations um, and that's what we've really found during this time maybe i'm i'm letting my mind kind of wander and um Maybe you could explain to me a little more when we were talking about how someone develops from having HIV to having AIDS. I understand it has to do with their uh, the functioning of their immune system, but how how does it happen that they go from having a stronger immune system to having a weaker one? Does it just kind of happen by itself? Do we know why it's happening? Could it have to do with diet? I mean. Can you explain a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, and that gets more into like the pathophysiology of the virus itself, but basically the virus is attacking your immune system. So it attacks specific cells within your immune system and essentially destroys those cells. So if you take like basically your cell count. So the specific cells, you know, you're attacking are your CD4 helper cells. It's specific in your immune system. And so say your count is about 300 and suddenly, you know, your the HIV virus is attacking those cells. So it's killing them off one by one, bringing it down, down, down to less than 200. And that's generally the threshold for that number that we monitor. And so now we are in a position where you don't have have enough of those cells to fight off um, exposures to different infections, right? So oftentimes we hear about lung infections. Well, it's because you're breathing in some organism and then because you don't have enough cells in your immune system to fight at the level you normally would have at, um, the organism can overwhelm whatever is left of your, of your immune system and kind of take over and cause the infection. So that's referring to the opportunistic infection. So AIDS is more like saying that I just don't have enough of this specific uh, cell in my immune system to fight off what I normally would fight off in the environment. So if someone has... Uh if they have HIV now, but they get COVID, could that be something so devastating to their immune system that it would accelerate it and, and they would end up with a diagnosis of AIDS? So we haven't seen any data to suggest that. Additionally, we actually haven't found um, that HIV has increased the risk for severe COVID infections. So we don't really understand yet why that is, um, but we haven't seen that it would accelerate uh, or cause um, your immune system to weaken drastically as a result of it. So, um, you know, that's been a common concern amongst our HIV patients. Now, that being said, someone who has AIDS, they obviously have a weak immune system to begin with. So then the fear is how will they react to COVID? And I don't, I haven't seen data in regards to this at this time, um, but we just, keep that in mind for our patients because it's definitely a concern. That's really fascinating. I have to tell you, every time I interview a femme doctor, I leave the conversation with a, a really, you know, good, better understanding of whatever field they practice. And I think, you know, I think that would be what I would want to do every <laughs> time. So now, of course, I'm thinking, I think I would really want to learn more about AIDS research. <laughs> It's a great field. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It's so fascinating. And um, it actually makes me want to read more about it. Are there any books you might recommend Aver just for the average person to un obviously can't understand it at the level that you would, but just to understand as a layman? So off the top of my head, I'd have to really think about like books that would really get you that information. A great um, there are a couple great tools you know, we're talking about the internet. So let's talk about like actual accurate websites that I would advise. So one organization I recommend is called the IDSA. Now it stands for the Infectious Diseases Society. I, maybe A is America. I'm not 100% sure, but IDSA is a great website to check out for information. Another one would be aids.gov. They have great statistics on there regarding, you know, the, the prevalence or incidence and prevalence of HIV and AIDS in the U.S., but they also provide information about symptoms, um, what does it mean to have AIDS. So if you're looking for more of that kind of information that's more easily digestible, I would definitely consider that website for sure. I will check those out. And then I have a couple of other just sort of nosy questions. Um, you had said it was your uncle that started a hospital in India um, and you visited there? Yes. Yep. Did you practice in the hospital? No, I didn't practice there. Um, I'm not licensed to practice there. But um, when I used to visit 
the hospital, it was when I was a lot younger. So I used to volunteer there in whatever form and whatever capacity that I was capable of and whatever the needs were at that time. But it was mostly, you know, transport the patient from X location to Y location in the hospital. Um, but once I got into med school and such, I didn't really have the opportunity at that time to go back and um, really, you know, help out in that capacity. I I did some volunteer work in um, Northern India though, where, and this really kind of launched my interest in infectious diseases. I uh, volunteered at a local orphanage in Northern India, which um, in which kids were, had HIV and AIDS. So these kids were living in this orphanage who had been abandoned by their families because they had this infection, which they had no control over getting. So that really triggered and kind of launched my interest in HIV and AIDS and infectious diseases in general. Um, and it kind of grew from there. So even though I trained in family medicine, one thing that I did was I did a lot of rotations in ID because of my you know, continued interest in that field. Okay. So I was about to ask you, how did you end up doing what you do now? And it sounds like you wanted to do something with that. Yeah, I, I absolutely did. And so, I mean, even, even as I started working in family medicine, I knew at some point, whether it was in my own practice or finding a specific opportunity where I worked with patients with HIV and AIDS, Family medicine offers you a lot in terms of spectrum and what you can do. And so I felt that even if I didn't, you know, find a specific job in HIV and AIDS work that I would try to expand my practice to care for such patients. So I knew regardless of what situation I was in, I was going to do that. But I came across this opportunity and, you know, um, you know, I actively pursued it. So I'm very grateful and thankful for this role. Well, now that you're working on a master's in public health, do you foresee in the future that you might um, move more away from the clinical side of things and do something more administrative? Or do you really want to keep your, you know, your footing in the clinical work? I think I'll still want to keep my foot in clinical work. It's very hard for me to think about stepping away from patient care. It was hard when, so I, we lived in Michigan before we moved to Georgia and it was very hard for me to leave my patients because, you know, I'd built relationships with them and that was the toughest thing about moving from Michigan. So for me, it would be very hard to completely leave the clinical setting. Um, does that mean that, you know, that that still means that I still want to do administrative work for sure. I want to do something on a policy level. I think there's a lot that needs to change in the public health field. Um, and so I hope to contribute in some way to that in the future. Well, now that you're learning more about public health, do you see um, any sort of mistakes or constructive criticism that you might offer for the way that we've handled this current pandemic? I think that one of the biggest things is that we were just not prepared for the pandemic. Um, public health is unfortunately has all has been underfunded. And so because of the lack of funding, we don't have things organized in a way that would have been more efficient at controlling the pandemic. So I think there's a lot to say about it. I think there's a lot that could have been done. And it's not necessarily a matter of having the right people in the public health field. It was more about having access to the funds needed to ensure that, for example, we had enough tests that you know, now that we have enough of the vaccine available. I mean, there's so many factors. It, it truly is multifactorial. So there are a lot of things that need to change. And I'm, I'm really hoping that with um, the new administration um, this week that things will change and the additional funding that's going to be provided is going to really help in controlling this pandemic. Have you had your vaccine? I did get the first dose. I am due for my second dose this week. And you look okay. You haven't grown any extra limbs or. <laughs> I have not mutated. No, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. <laughs> Good. See that everybody? She's a-okay. <laughs> 
I have to ask you too, just when I was stalking you before this interview <laughs> <laughs> on the internet, on the gram, yeah, I, on the gram. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I see that your husband is a physician as well. And you refer to him as um, practicing academic medicine. And I just have to know, what is that? <laughs> is he a professor? Is he a, a medical school well, teacher? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good question. So academic medicine means that he works with residents in training. So he works out of a residency clinic where he trains future family physicians. So after medical school, you go through residency training and that's where he comes in as one of the faculty of his of the residency program he works in to train these residents. Um, and then once they finish the residency training, then they go out to be full-fledged attendings and physicians. So that's what he does in academics. Does he lecture like a professor? Yes, they do have didactics. So he does do that as well as part of the, the training. But um, what he does is he works on an outpatient setting. So in the clinic, um, residents will have their own patient panel that they see, but they have to be supervised by a licensed attending physician. And so that's where he steps in and he supervises those visits and educates them on specific diagnoses and such in addition to providing and giving lectures. I'd love to be a fly on the wall at your house when over dinner. <laughs> hear you guys yeah, the conversations get pretty nerdy I have to say <laughs> yeah I would think that you it's probably hard not to talk about work all the time especially when your husband is also a physician you yeah it's for, it's interesting because it's easy for me to talk about it he really likes to leave work at work but for me you know and there are times where he'll be like there was just this case and whatever but like in my situation with my patient panel, um, I think it's a personality thing that I bring it home and he tries not to, but then I'm bringing up this happened. And so, I mean, we still have, we, we do have those conversations for sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I think that would be entertaining for me to hear that. Okay. So I, I don't know if I gave you a heads up on this question. I apologize if I didn't, but are there any books just in general in, in the course of your life that have made a real impact on you? That's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, you know, I think about scientific books, but in general, in terms of books that have really made a difference in my life, um, I want to say, and I'm forgetting the name right off the top of my head, um, was Michelle Obama's book that recently came out. Becoming? Becoming, yes. I absolutely, I listen to the audio book. So I'm on the go a lot. So it's not easy to sit down with a physical book, but I really enjoyed listening to her audio book because I personally find her to be a role model. But, you know, she, I think she's accomplished so much in her life. But I think her book, the biggest thing about it was her talking about her struggles with, um, having a career and being a mother, you know, a parent and a wife. And I think that's something that I often am trying to balance or I'm trying to balance that all the time. So it was really nice to hear, you know, kind of what she went through and how she, you know, really worked to balance everything in her life. So, you know, I definitely look up to her and I think it's a great audiobook. Did she narrate it? Yes, which is oh. what makes it even better. So you get to hear her reading it. <laughs> I I usually don't do audiobooks because I feel like my mind just goes off and I'm like, oh, wait, yeah. I wasn't listening. But I feel like I would listen to that one. I yeah. would rather than read it. So I'm glad you told me that I'm going to I have the book. It's on my shelf and I haven't read it yet, but I think maybe I'm just going to get the audio book. I, I would highly recommend it. Um, I, I think it's, I love it when the, writer actually reads the book because you know it's not just their words it's their voice so I love that yes and you know that their inflection is going to be exactly how they meant it yeah exactly, exactly. I think that Barack Obama also narrated his recent book too that's what I've heard. So I have a physical copy of his memoir, which is huge. And this is volume one. But um, I think I'm going to switch over to the audiobook soon because uh, I really, really do want to take a listen to that. Yeah, I'm with you on that. 
Okay, so I just have to plug you if anybody wants to check you out and stalk you on the internet like I did. Um, check out your podcast, and that's at Brown Girl White Coat Pod, and also at Doctor Dot Avi Varma. And I'm yeah. gonna have links to all of this in uh, the show notes so that people can find you easily. Um, I have to thank you for sharing all of this information. And I actually would like to end with um, giving you an opportunity to sort of do a PSA. Is is there anything? Um, about AIDS awareness that you would really like the public to know? It could be just something like really basic. Yeah, I think that, you know, we didn't really get into it, but there's still a, you know, huge stigma around HIV and AIDS. And I think what needs to be realized is that even though it's not as common as it was before, because we have prevention methods and such with medication, it is still pretty prevalent in the United States. It's not in a broad disease. It's something that we do see here in the United States. And I think we're continuing to fight the stigma of HIV and AIDS. And I think it's something that we all need to really take a hard look at and try to work together to get rid of that stigma for sure. So I think that's something that's really, really important. And um, it's something that I, I hope to talk more about as well in the future. Well, I would love to have you on the podcast again, if there's ever something else more specific that you want to talk about. And that sounds like a great topic. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's really my pleasure. And I'm, I'm glad that we got to talk about this. My, now my obsession will be um, <laughs> going to medical school so I can do what <laughs> you do. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Keep me posted on that. I will.